God's good. I don't know about you, but every week's uh, a good week. It's a week. Every week's a good week, whether we have challenges or not, isn't it? Huh? You know, challenges are what bring us closer to Him. And, and, uh, I'm just. That's how I see life now. Every experience is something to learn from. And look, we all make mistakes. There is no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus who walk in the Spirit. Amen? Amen. So we all make mistakes. And sometimes, you know, I know in my own life, we can get stuck. We can get stuck in those errors or sin or mistakes we've made and overcompensate sometimes by becoming so fearful we're going to make a mistake again. I know you know what I'm talking about because we're all human beings. And... uh, uh, you know, there's something the Holy Spirit was speaking to me on the way down. He just wants you to know the Lord loves you. Yeah. And he's not holding that transgression of the past against any one of us. Yeah. If we brought it before him, it's over. Mm-hmm. And don't allow the enemy to, 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 to help you to overcompensate and become so fearful you can't do anything for the Lord. Mm. You know, I've got, I even wrote a note last night. We don't need to wait until we get a word of prophecy. Mm. We don't need to wait till we get a vision. We don't need to wait till, till we hear a booming voice from God. Amen. Providing what we're doing is aligned to his word. Yeah. That's what matters. And all of us have had knocks in life. I mean, we're human beings. So don't allow those knocks to hold you back. Doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. Yeah. Amen? Uh, last week we, we started a message um, that I said I didn't know how long it was going to take. Uh, and I don't. But I, I want to carry on and pick up if I can find where I was. Of course, it was the story of Joseph taken out of the book of Genesis. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I, I'm really enjoying studying this. And you know, it doesn't matter how many times we read something. If we're listening, the Holy Spirit will keep giving us more and more and more. And uh, that's what I love about the Word of God. It doesn't matter how many times you can read something. God can keep bringing fresh revelation to us. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, I mean. So I just want to quickly recap. I'm not going to la- take too long on this. We started a series called From Dream to Destiny. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, I said that God gives us all a dream or all of us are called. The Bible says that, you know, all of us have been called by God. So all of us have a dream. Some of us don't know what that is, admittedly, and some do. Many, many people get stuck in between the dream, God giving the calling or the dream to actually stepping into the destiny of fulfilling that. And in Joseph's life, it took many, many years before he stepped into it. It was approximately 20 years before he started walking in his destiny. I mean, you know, I've got to say, I've blown it here before. When God has placed a call on my life for something and I've thought, I've got to do it now. And, and, and I've rushed out ahead of God, not because the dream wasn't ready for me to step into, but I wasn't ready to step into it. And I think it's something we, we probably all can relate to. Every person has a destiny, a plan, a purpose given by God Almighty. And that plan is conditional upon us complying with the condition of that plan. Hmm? So God did not create man to choose his own plan. In other words, God didn't say to you, choose what you want to do. <laughs> That's not the way God works. And, um, and, and then I say, God bless my plan. And so many people get discouraged because that's what they do. And then they say, well, God's not hearing me. Mm-hmm. No, because you actually haven't stepped into his plan. You've stepped into your plan. Mm-hmm. We're using the story of Joseph, um, Genesis chapter 37. I think if you've got your Bibles, open them there. And um, I want to unlock some more of these vital character tests. That's what I've called them. I believe there's 10 character tests that Joseph encounters. Mm -hmm. The first one we talked about was pride. The second was the pit test. I don't know if you remember. And um, the third test, once Joseph is out of the pit, that he faces is, I've called it the palace test. You can call it what you want. But it's when Joseph has come out of this 
places of, of oppression, the four prison walls, as it were, uh, I'm sure you can relate to and I can relate to being in like a prison in your life. Not physically in Rimataka, but in a prison. Four walls where you can't see out beyond those walls. It's like you pull these curtains, all you can see is the walls. And, and, and you think, now what? Well, Joseph now has got out of this and he's into this next test. And I've called it the palace test and the test that comes with promotion. So Joseph now has been promoted out of the pit. And he's stepping in to his destiny. He hasn't arrived yet, but he's starting to. And in Genesis chapter 39, sorry, in verse 1 and verse 2, we'll pick it up from there. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar and officers of Pharaoh, sorry, the officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph he was a successful man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Verse 3, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. Bear in mind, his master is not a believer. Huh? The master can see that God is with Joseph, and yet he's not a believer. He doesn't go to church, so he doesn't know the right talk or the right walk, and yet he can pick up something's in this guy's life. So verse 3, his master was with him, and the Lord made all he did prosper. Mm. They are three very, very powerful verses. From this text, we can extract four keys for prospering in all we do. When I talk about prospering, our minds automatically go to money, so switch that one off. That's not <laughs> what I'm talking about. All right? I'm not into this hyper-prosperity message. I'm, talking, I'm going to tell you what the Bible's version of prosperity is, which will flatten that straight away. Biblical prosperity means the manifest presence of the Lord is with you. That is the biblical definition of prosperity. Don't, look, don't believe me, look it up in the Hebrew. The manifest presence of the Lord is with you. Meaning, if you're in the pit, he's with you. If you're in the prison, he's with you. Amen. If you're in the palace, he's with you. Yes. And everything you do, God is pushing you forward. Amen. So biblical prosperity means the manifest presence of the Lord is Amen. with you. Do I believe God can financially bless us? Of course, I'm sure we all do. Do I believe that God wants to do that to everyone? I'm not going to go there. Because <laughs> I've lived in poor countries and I know that those people, all they need is a meal. That's prosperity to them. Mm -hmm. God's manifest presence is different than his omnipresence. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that many of my friends in life have struggled with, understanding when we talk about the Lord was with Joseph, the Lord is everywhere. He's omnipresent. Yeah, yeah. He's everywhere. Yeah. He's near the unbeliever as he is the believer. He's in this room. He's near you. He's everywhere. Mm. The manifest presence of God is a very different thing. The manifest presence of God is when whatever you do, God is manifesting himself through you. Yeah. That's the prosperity. And that's what he wants us to all walk in, the manifest presence of God. Mm -hmm. So the first key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. That's the first key to prosperity, the presence of the Lord. Notice these words, the Lord was with him. You can read that over and over again in those three verses. The Lord, you say, well, the Lord's with me. Yes, he is, but the Lord is everywhere, omnipresent. Yeah. The manifest or the outworking presence of God I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Obedience to what God instructs us to do with all our life is key to keeping the enemy out. That's prosperity. Amen. So the Bible says Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Mm. What does it mean? The manifest presence of the Lord was no longer functioning through Cain's life. Yeah. Could have Cain have called out to God? Of course he could, wherever he was. But the manifest presence, the, the presence that... that we call it the blessing of God, that, that presence that, that brings everything we do to prosper mm -hmm. according to our calling. That's what we're talking about. The 
the first sign we have left the presence of the Lord is lost desire for the Word of God. I'll say it again. The first sign we have left the presence of the Lord. I could reverse it and say the presence, the manifest presence has left you. Is we have lost the desire for the word of God. Yeah. You see, the Bible says he will never leave me or forsake me. I'm going to get to that in a minute. I'm going to squash that sacred cow once and for all. Because we're talking about the manifest presence, not the omnipresence. Mm. The first sign is we've lost the desire for the word of God. Or could we say the first sign of the manifest presence of the Lord has left us is lost desire for his word. When I lose that hunger for his word, the manifest presence of the Lord is gradually pulling back from me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to back this up with scripture. This is not just my revelation. Chapter 2, verse 4, Jesus challenges the believers at the Ephesus church. He gives them a warning what's going to happen if they don't heed his advice. Remember, the church at Ephesus was a very powerful, strong church. This was a church that taught the word of God. These are not babes as we would know babes in the church. This church had been birthed out of a revival from the Apostle Paul and Paul either caused trouble wherever he went or revival or both and in this case both and um, trouble in the sense that he stirred up people's lives and Paul turns up into Ephesus and a revival breaks out and this church is birthed out of revival the problem this church was before it was birth was encountering was there was so much demonic spiritual oppression in the city <coughs> that was coming through the occult and through pagan beliefs and paul could see that and jesus challenges this church and he says in revelation 2 verse 4 jesus challenged it he said you've lost your first love or we could say they no longer were hungry for him. And when we talk about hungering for him, we're talking about hungering for this. Because him and his word are one. We can't get away from that. The word of God has been placed even above his own name. Mm -hmm. When we lose that hunger, we're starting to look like that church. This is the same church the Apostle Paul had those amazing words put on the whole armor of God. This is the same church. Mm -hmm. We love quoting it. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wild. This is the church those words were spoken to. Mm -hmm. They had overcome great spiritual battles, great paganism to become this powerful church against false teaching, false doctrine, watered down teaching. This is the same church where we read Paul giving out bits of his clothing and handkerchiefs and the sick were healed. When we read that, this is the church. <laughs> this is it. You come to church, oh, what's in my clothes? Paul would rip his clothes. He was a tent maker. He'd rip up the tents that he was making. Give you a piece of the... Go and lay that on the sick. This is the same church that he's talking to, that Jesus is talking to. Bear in mind this. These believers were not even aware the manifest presence of the Lord had departed from their midst. They were not even aware. In other words, they were turning up to church on Saturday, because that's when they met probably, maybe every day. They were doing church. People would have been giving their hearts to Christ in the church, but the manifest presence of God had left them. And so Jesus warns them, come back to your first love. Come back to your first love. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we need someone to tell us. Yeah. I, know, I know I've needed that in my life. Someone we need, sometimes we need someone who actually loves us enough to tell us the truth. Mm -hmm. 
you walked away from your first love. And I know that's not preached much in a lot of churches. But sometimes we need to be told because that's what true love is. Mm. Jesus said, if you see in Matthew 18, I think it was, if you see your brother sin, go and tell him. Go and point out a sin. And if that brother or sister listens and confesses their sin, you've won them back. That's what he says. Yeah. Why are we afraid to go and stand with our brothers and sisters who have fallen and tell them the truth? Probably rejection, I don't know. But we need to overcome that. See, to win them back means they had to have left to start with. Mm -hmm. huh? yes. To win them back means they've already left. And when we start justifying our sin, our deeds, and of the flesh, and our deliberate violation of the word of God, we've left our first love and pride has taken over. Pride. Pride is always the first sin that takes over. Remember last week, talked about Joseph's first sin? Pride. Mm -hmm. Always is the first sin. Lucifer, pride. Mm -hmm. You and me, pride. Mm -hmm. And each one of us knows where our personal struggles are. So we must be willing to say to those struggles, it is written. Amen. Amen. It is written. Amen. That's the answer to it. Yeah. It is written. Not what I think, not what sister so-and-so said, or brother so-and-so, or pastor, or evangelist. doesn't matter how big a church that guy's got. doesn't matter. It is written. Amen. That's what matters. The Bible says, let him that thinks he stand take heed, yeah. unless he falls. Remember, out of the seven churches addressed in the second chapter of, of, of the book of Revelation, out of the seven, there was no promise to them who did not overcome. No one was promised anything from God unless they overcame. Wow. That kind of puts it in perspective. We are overcomers. We will overcome. Number two, another sign we've left his presence is silence. Long periods of time when we no longer are hearing the Lord. We all go through valley periods where there's a little bit of, you know what I mean. I'm talking about long periods of seasons of, mm. I'm not hearing nothing. The manifest presence of God has left. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 6, when Saul inquired of the Lord, and the Lord did not answer, it says. That's a scary place to be in. Mm -hmm. huh? Saul inquired of the Lord, and the Lord did not answer him. And Saul said to Samuel, I'm so concerned, I'm so distressed. This is his words. The Philistines wage war against me. And the Lord has departed from me, and he's not giving me any answers anymore. That's a scary place to be in. You're in a, I mean, we're in a spiritual battle. This is a parallel. Paul, Saul was in this physical battle, but it's exactly the same. Actually, our battle is even more powerful. Because you are fighting a spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Saul was wrestling against flesh and blood and the presence, the manifest presence. Mm. Let's get it right. The manifest presence of God had withdrawn from Saul. Saul had gone from winning battles to losing battles. These are all signs. Jesus said, by your fruit. So the fruit of our lives are evidence. We can't argue with fruit. The fruit is evidence of what's happening at that time in our life. Mm -hmm. We've got to be big enough to humble ourselves and say, help, help, help. It's not a sin that the presence, the manifest presence has left. It's a sin to not press into God and humble ourselves. Once we know. Saul's gone from winning to losing. He's gone from taking heed of the word of God and the prophets and the old covenant to no longer obeying it. You say, well, that's old covenant, Martin. I'll get to that in a minute. And Jesus said the son can do nothing, nothing by himself. Mm -hmm. Nothing by himself. But only what I see my father do. This scripture has become part of my life. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. And, you know, even up until last night, the Holy Spirit gave me further revelation, and it's probably something you already know. But when he says, 
when he says this, he said, the son can do nothing by himself, but only what I see my father do. So that's what the Holy Spirit said. When you read the word, you're seeing what the father does. That's really simple. But I had never had that revelation up until last night. When you read the word, you are seeing what the father does. Jesus lived out of the word of God. Simple. That's how he lived. Out of the word of with God. Now he didn't have the new covenant, but he had the old. <laughs> he had the Torah. And he lived out of that which was the word of God. So we don't have any excuse either. We've got the word of God. So what this means to you and me is we can do nothing of ourselves other than what God's word says. What we see, we do. So when we read it, we do it. <laughs> we don't wrestle against it. Oh, I don't like that. <laughs> we do it. There's a danger here. You know, I think I said this at the beginning. I'm going to reiterate this. The enemy would like us to do nothing for God's kingdom. He will try convincing you and me we need a word for every situation. And that is not what the scripture means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh? Fear can trap us into believing we need a prophecy or a dream or a vision before we do anything for the Lord. Don't get caught in that trap. I have been caught there myself. Because of past failures, we can get caught. Mm -hmm. The other one he'll use is, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. <laughs> I'm not good enough to do anything for God. I'm better just to bury myself under the bushel keep my light hidden no you're all good enough because he's in you and he's good not you yeah. so each one of us each one of us are ready to serve Amen. each one of us that was the mindset of the prodigal son remember he said I'm not worthy mm -hmm. even when he come back even when he had repented have you ever been there? Am I the only one? Mm. You repent, you still feel unworthy. Yeah. You still feel not good enough. I can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> and it just it just shuts everything down in your life. Where you, I can't do anything. You know, maybe I'll clean the toilets in the church. <laughs> I can't do anything for God because I've blown it. But don't allow that to trap you and hold you. Jesus. I'm afraid I'll mess up again. And fear traps us from our calling. And each one of you have a great calling on your life. That's the voice of condemnation, for God did not send his son to condemn the world. Mm. Amen? Amen? But it may be safe through him. Hmm? Jesus told his disciples, go. He's telling you and me, go. Amen. This is a new day for each one of us. Mm. That's, I, I just keep hearing that song as I'm driving down in my head this morning. It's a new day. It's a new, this is a new day for each one of us. Let's forget about the past. Let's put the past behind us. Let's not hold on to those things that would try and enslave us. Jesus told his disciples, go, and he's telling you and me to go. We don't need a specific word for it. Amen. You've been given the commission. There's the word. <laughs> I only do what I see my father do. It's already there. <laughs> yeah. Go. Huh? Yeah. How do we see what the father does? By staying in that. So number three, defeat. Saul could no longer succeed in whatever he did. Failure was all around him. Saul could no longer succeed. Whatever he did failed. And you might say, yeah, but that's old covenant. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, Behold, I'm with you always, even until the end of the earth. Mm -hmm. And someone says, yeah. And in Hebrews 13, 5, it says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Mm -hmm. And you're right. Mm -hmm. And you're right. By the way, that, that scripture out of Hebrews, lovely scripture, it's taken out of Joshua 1. Verse 5, I think. That's where it's drawn from. When it's quoted in Hebrews, he's actually drawing it out of Joshua chapter 1. And I wish I knew my Bible like I used to. I wish I could remember my Bible. He's talking to Moses, and, and I, I think in that, and he says, No man shall stand against you, something to that effect. No man shall stand before you. And, and he's talking about going into battle. Um, yeah. I will never leave you. If someone's got it, you can read it. 
Uh, one five. Five. Mm -hmm. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. He's talking to Joshua. That's it. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Yeah. That was the promise. Going into battle, see, always put the thing in perspective too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's going into battle here, and God's just reminding him, hey, mm -hmm. i got your back here. <laughs> I've got your back. Mm -hmm. And uh, we love to hold on to partial scriptures and quote them, but we need to put the thing into context, the scripture into context. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says, Be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid or tremble. At them who are the enemy. For the Lord your God is the one who goes before you and he shall not fail you nor forsake you. Mm. That promise is for you and me. Amen. The promise he will never leave you nor forsake you is to remind us to do something for the Lord and he is with you. Mm. That's what the promise is for. Not for us to hold on to everything he's given us and not use it for his glory. Yeah, that's right. Not to hold on to it and say I'm afraid of failure. No. Use it and remember this. I'll never leave you or forsake mm. you. Mm. <laughs> Even if you blow it, get back up again on the horse. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It's important we make the distinction of God's omnipresence mm. and God's manifest presence. God's presence is everywhere, yet only obedience will maintain his manifest presence. Only obedience mm. maintains his manifest presence presence does the presence of God leave you if you read it in perspective the manifest presence of God will leave us if we are not obedient mm -hmm. yes in other words everything I do will fail I will struggle with everything and it doesn't matter whether we've been in the Lord one month or 90 years the manifest presence of God can leave us yeah. and we need to humble ourselves and if we're being defeated in every corner we need to humble ourselves and say Lord you made me a successor mm. of your son Jesus he overcome everything and I'm your son I'm your daughter mm. I want to overcome also and right at the moment this is not happening yeah. so show me what it is show me what it is that where I need to turn back. I love this word manifest. I looked it up in the English dictionary. Something that is clear for the eye or the mind. In other words, God's presence on a person's life can be identified. Mm -hmm. You can see it. You can hear it. Mm -hmm. You can. Uh, uh, this is what this is what Potiphar could see upon Joseph. Yeah. The manifest presence of God. Yes. The outworking of God and whatever he did. He never withdraws his covenant. Never ever withdraws his covenant. Which is given by grace. But the promises of the covenant are mostly conditional. And I say mostly because there are a few that aren't. I mean, for example... Well, even salvation, I was going to say salvation isn't conditional, but it, it is in the sense that we need to repent of our sins and turn. Once you're saved, then you're in the covenant, but the benefits or the promises of that covenant are dependent on the manifest presence of God working in our lives. It's only when we return to him once again and embrace us, sorry, when we embrace him, mm -hmm. he embraces us. Remember the prodigal son? Run to his father. Father embraces him, puts a robe on him. He didn't say, well, you've got to go to a Bible school now because you blew it. He didn't say, you've got, yeah. you've got to sit down for five years and do nothing and prove yourself. He put the robe on him straight away. Now, do I believe that as far as a pastor go, yeah, I, I, you know, in my own life I stood down a couple of times where I've blown it, and I know I've blown it, and I don't need someone to tell me. <laughs> I just withdraw myself. I don't mean for a week. I'm talking a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I stop ministering the Word of God because I need to press into Him and get my life right. That is the right thing to do for a minister of the Gospel, but for, mm -hmm. for, for someone who, who is, for example, as far as the Great Commission, no. 
Absolutely not. As soon as you've been forgiven, you're good to go, man. Get out there and do it again. Doesn't matter whether you murder someone. Look at Paul. Paul was out there murdering people. Then he's one of the greatest preachers, if not the greatest preacher in the history of the church. Never, ever, ever allow failure to defeat you. Well, you know, I think one thing that's really sad is, and I draw a lot of this from my own experience, when we, the manifest presence of God has left us, we're not aware of it. Mm. We become blind. It's like we have something over us we can't see. And so many, this has happened to and is happening to, but they're not aware Mm. of what's happened. I'll give you some biblical examples. Saul himself, Eli, his sons, Mm. still functioning in the church, preaching, didn't know the presence of God and lifted off them. Jonah, Mm. Peter, they're great men of God. They didn't know. Thank God two of them turned back. Jonah and Peter turned back, repented. The others didn't. All were challenged by God to return, and only two of them, of those I said, repented and turned back. I want to say this. Our sin does not keep the manifest presence of God away from us. Now, please hear what I'm saying. Our sin does not keep his manifest presence away. Not repenting of the sin does. Mm. Mm. I think we need to get hold of that because the enemy loves to condemn people. Once we've repented, I know this, you know all this stuff, but we need to keep reminding ourselves. Mm. Once you've repented, you can give the one finger salute to Mr. Devil. When he comes knocking on the door. <laughs> huh? uh, we're talking about the presence of God and what is the biblical meaning of prosperity. And the word prosperity in the Hebrew is this word. It's the word salak, S-A-L-A-C-H, and it means to push forward. Literally what it means is God is behind me and he's... And I was, God, stop it, stop it. And he's pushing me along. God is pushing your life forward. In other words, you're not stagnant. Mm. You're moving forward all the time. Mm. That's what it means, to push forward prosperity. Mm. When our life becomes stagnant for long durations of time, it's a sign God is not pushing us forward, which tells us there's something stopping God from pushing me forward. Mm. Humility once again. The word denotes an ongoing change for the better. That's what it means. An ongoing change for the better. That's what our life should be. God is constantly pushing us forward for the better. And we're so accustomed to this hyper-prosperity message that cannot be fully supported by Scripture. Does God want to prosper? Yes, he does. Do I give money so he'll prosper? No. Mm. I give money because I want to be obedient. (laughs) I don't do it for a hidden motive because there's no reward back for that. Mm. We're so accustomed to that message, many have stopped believing God wants to prosper them. And that's so sad because God wants to prosper each one of us. In every area of our life. Mm. Every area of our life. Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in good health even as your soul. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Even as this thing prospers. It's always this thing that gets in the way, isn't it? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's always that thing. There's a clear link between the presence of the Lord and our mind being renewed to his way of thinking. 
there is a clear link there. The manifest presence of the Lord and the renewing of my mind are one of the same. What we need to do when we're struggling, this is what I believe, is find someone where God is actually, you know that God is in that person's life. Like the disciples got beside Jesus. We need to find somebody who can stand with us and we can stand with them. Mm -hmm. Because we can see the manifest presence in that person's life. We need to get around that person to pull us out. Not that he or she is any better than you or me, but God is all over them. And if God is doing something in them, I want what he's doing. Mm. Mm. <laughs> would be silly not to. Mm. It's not about going to a big church of big numbers, because often that doesn't mean anything. It means the music's good and the seats are comfortable. Be around someone where the manifest presence of God mm. is obvious. Find out what God's doing and get in on it. Prosperity is not measured by what we have, huh? but by what we give. Yeah. That's prosperity. Mm -hmm. It's not measured by what we have, but what we give. And when we give with no other motive than wanting to bless someone, God pushes us forward. Mm -hmm. Find out what he's doing, get in on it. You know, some people got a problem with this whole God wants to prosper us because automatically we think money and money is the least of all of this. Yes. Really. Mm -hmm. I mean, we actually don't need money. We just need God because mm -hmm. even the ravens fear to lie to I've had some amazing testimonies on the mission field, you know, of God providing things for people and not mm -hmm. just food, but just, you know, filling up tanks and vehicles or bikes or just... I could give you some myself. We're just total miracles, and you, only because of God's grace. Yes. Yeah. And God puts us in a place where He's blessing us for a reason. Don't feel guilty or uncomfortable if He blesses you. Some of us have trouble receiving. Mm. Oh. Yes. Oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I have trouble receiving. Don't feel guilty receiving. That's the prodigal son syndrome. <laughs> I'm not worthy. You are worthy. Because of him, not because of you. <laughs> yeah? And even the master of Joseph was being blessed just because Joseph was being blessed. <laughs> it's a good deal. Because Joseph's being blessed, it rubs off on the master. An unbeliever could see God was with Joseph. So if the key to prosperity in your life is the presence of the Lord, the key to the presence of the Lord, and I'm going to try and speed this up a bit, is obedience. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 14, the Bible says, David behaved wisely, that word wisely actually means to obey, in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Yeah. Yeah. We know that David blew it, so how can the Bible tell us that David behaved wisely in all his ways? Because God doesn't remember our sin. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. David didn't behave wisely all the time. We know that. We don't have to go into the story. But the word of God tells us. David behaved wisely. Or obeyed God in all his ways. And the Lord was with him. David blew it. Just like you and me. But he repented. Yeah, the Bible says that our sin is cast from the east as far as from the west yes. and he remembers it no more <laughs> it's only the enemy wants you to remember yeah. the past 1 yeah. Samuel chapter 18 verse 12 now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him mm -hmm. and had departed Saul Saul could see <laughs> that the presence of God is on David and he's afraid <laughs> mm -hmm. he's afraid of this young David, that's why he wanted to kill him, of course. 
And, you know, here's a simple question. Why was the Lord with David? Because he obeyed him, right? Why wasn't the Lord with Saul? Because he didn't obey him. It's a really simple question, but it's a powerful question and answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about obedience. Huh? Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now I hold before you this day a blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord and a curse if you do not obey the command of the Lord. And someone says, but we're saved by grace. Mm -hmm. And yes, we are. And not by what we do, and that's true. But God's grace ensures our internal salvation. But if we are to prosper here, on earth, we must work out our salvation in fear and trembling, the Bible says, mm -hmm. and overcome the enemy's deceptions. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. There is two ways to go through a storm, with God or without him. It's much better to go with him, yeah. <laughs> as the disciples found out in that boat that day. It's much better to be with him than without him. And uh, point number three, the key to obedience is faith. Without faith... The Bible says it's impossible to please him. Obedience always brings a reward. And that's why God gave the promise of a child to obey their parents. Now we're all parents or being parents, I guess, here at some stage. Uh, I threw this in because I think there's a lot of relevance in this wonderful scripture, Ephesians 6, verse 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father, your mother, which is the first command with promise, that it may be well with you and you live long on the earth. And uh, we need to teach our children to obey. But while we're on this subject, the reason a child does not obey, I concluded this week is one of two things. It always stems, the root of it is a loss of respect. And that comes from, number one, no, no consequences in their life. No consequences. What I mean by that is their bad behavior is discouraged, which we do as parents. We're all very good at that. But their good behavior is not rewarded. Mm -hmm. And this came to me when I was in the pet shop this week. And the woman there said, you need some treats. I said, what are you talking about? She said, treats for your puppy. I said, what do you mean treats? She said, when he does good, reward him for it. And this come to me. Some of us, even myself, not been too good at rewarding the good behavior enough. Well, we reward it if they win first prize in the class at the end of the year. But I'm talking about this ongoing praise, this ongoing encouragement for the good things they're doing on a daily basis. It's so wonderful. Just reward them. I, I've got to say that sometimes when Emmy goes to work, she'll leave a chocolate hidden in the house for me and I'll find it because I like a chocolate. And she's rewarding me. I don't know what for. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it, it's something, we need to do this to each other as well as to our children. Reward for good behavior. <laughs> Encourage. I notice that that little puppy, all he wants is love. All he wants is to be told, you're so wonderful, and pat him and his tail's like that. It, I guess we're all like that. <laughs> huh? yeah, sometimes we're going to tell him off for, for doing something wrong, but... I think we need to focus more on the positive and highlight the positive in a child. So no consequences. Ah, well. And the other reason as a child does not obey is because of hypocrisy. Do as I say, but not as I do. And there's so much of that in this world today, isn't it? We're visual creatures who learn by our senses, not just by what we hear. What we see teaches us, not just what we hear. When a child hears mum say, I want you to respect me, and she does not show respect to her husband, the lines of understanding become blurred. What they see, they learn from. I know I'm not telling you anything new. And likewise, when a husband does not show respect to his wife, the lines become blurred. Mm. Hebrews Chapter 3, verse 
18 to verse 19. And whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest, but those who did not obey? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief which is, of course, the opposite of faith, and faith produces obedience. And if they had believed God, he would have rewarded them. <laughs> God rewards us for good behavior. Amen. It's true. Amen. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> and sometimes as parents, we forget to reward our children for their good behavior. But we want to reward them for their bad behavior by disciplining them. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get so far on the wrong side. <laughs> so go ahead, reward them. So the key, take them out sometimes and just bless them. What are we doing? We just want to bless you. We're just taking you out to bless you. I'm, you know, as a parent, I'm sure all of you are the same. If you could redo it over again, you'd probably do some things differently. I know I would. And that's the area that, I mean, we had, we raised two boys and the last one to me was an absolute breeze. But I look back now and I think, I only wish I had have done this more. You think of that as you get older. I, I only wish I had have spent more time. I only wish I had have rewarded them for their good behaviour. Not waiting till the end of the year till he won top of the class or whatever. So the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. The key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. And the key to obedience is faith. And the key to faith is hearing the word of God. Mm -hmm. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. The more we hear it, the more it's going to change us. And the, <coughs> I won't go into this today. I think I've probably talked too much now. The next test, next one next week, is the purity test that Joseph faces. Mm -hmm. Joseph overcome the palace test. Yes, but the next test is the purity test. Mm -hmm. And this is one that we're all going to be able to get something out of. All of us. Mm -hmm. All of us. Joseph's overcome the pride test, the pit test. And he's overcome the palace test. And the next one he faces is going to be the purity test. And uh, I don't think we've got time today. Mm. But next time I'll bring it. Yeah. Enjoy. I hope you get something out of this. Uh, you know, if you don't, that's okay, because I am. Mm. <laughs> and you're sitting there listening to me, so I don't care. I, you know, I, I do put a lot of time into my study. Mm. This week I haven't had the same luxury, and probably this week coming is going to be similar. But I, um, I just love preparing these messages for myself. I truly... Please don't take this the wrong way. I don't care whether you come or not. D don't take that the wrong way. I do this for myself. And I, I study the Word of God for myself. I don't study it to preach. Mm. I could preach here without opening my Bible to you. I, so what I give you is what the Lord is giving me. And I believe that's how it should be. Mm. Whether there is only me here or whether there's a thousand, it's okay. <laughs> Because I'm just excited to share what God's given me. <laughs> Father, thank you for your wonderful mercy. Lord, your mercy is on you every morning. We have nothing to prove to anyone. Except we want to love you. We want to obey you. We do want to please you. Mm. Just like any child wants to please their parent, we want to please you. And Lord, I pray that if there be any condemnation that's in our lives, that you'd forgive us for carrying it, mm. that you'd remove that from us and bring a peace into our minds that you love us just how you've made us. We realize that there's an enemy that would like to harm us, destroy us, kill us. Yes, keep us depressed and discouraged. Mm -hmm. But that's not your nature. Yes, Lord, I commit this week on behalf of my brothers and sisters here. Mm -hmm. To you, I, I pray, Father, that by your precious Holy Spirit that you'd speak to each one of us. Mm -hmm. 
you'd stir our hearts. You'd show us where we need to make adjustments and changes and draw us close to you. The song said, draw us close, never let us go. Lord, that's our prayer today. Never let your manifest presence be removed from us. We know that, Lord, you're, you're, you're everywhere because you're omnipresent. But, Lord, we don't want to lose the manifest presence of God. We want to hear from you. We want to walk in what you have for us. And we commit this week ahead, Lord, to you. I thank you for my brothers and sisters, Lord. May they be blessed this week. May you do something in their lives to enrich them in a way they know it's you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. God bless you all.